Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to each one of you. My name is Prachi and I would be your moderator for the afternoon. At Kiwi Tech, we take pride in leading innovation towards creating a better tomorrow. We are a growing ecosystem of entrepreneurs, investors, mentors, accelerators, incubators, and corporations. We help early and growth stage startups build viable products, drive traction, raise capital, and scale their businesses. We are currently home to 3,000 plus investors and 500 plus portfolio companies across 15 plus industries undergoing disruption. And today we are joined by founder and CEO, Dr. Trevor P. Castor and his colleagues from Affios Pharma. And they will be discussing how they're taking on traditional treatments for diseases such as opioids and substance use disorders, chronic pain, cancer pain, anxiety, and multiple sclerosis with nano-encapsulated green biotechnology therapeutics. You can learn you know, much about this technology as well as what they're doing. Dr. Trevor P. Castor is a PhD, President and Chief Executive Officer. He has over 30 years of diversified business experience, ranging from management, marketing, finance to technology and business development in the energy and environmental pharmaceutical industries. He has had the bottom line experience with several high tech startups. Dr. Castor graduated from the University of California, Berkeley with a PhD in mechanical engineering and a master of science degree in chemical engineering. He graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor of science degree in chemical engineering from the University of Toronto, Canada. He studied business administration at St. Mary's College, Brooklyn, New York, and management marketing and finance at Harvard University Extension Program, Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is the primary author of 36 issued US and international patents and 15 pending patents. Dr. Castor has collaborated with and consulted to several multinational companies, including Baxter Healthcare, Bayer AG, Bristol Myers, Squibb, Ellie Lilly, General Electric, Nova what is AG and the Gillette Company, and financial institutions such as the Bank of New England and New England Life Insurance Company. I would now warmly love to welcome Dr. Trevor P. Castro on screen with us. Yes, hi. All right. I hi, am on right audience. now. How are you, Raji? Very well, Dr. Castro. Yes. The screen is all yours. Go ahead. All the well, best. thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, meet the audience and present Afia's Farmer today. Um, should I share the screen now and go ahead and do that? Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Castor. Thank you. You're welcome. All the best, Dr. Castor. Thank you. Well, thank you for your patience. Um, I'd like to introduce Afia's Farmer, tell you a little bit about who we are what are we about and what are our plans? And then to follow that up by a question and answer period so we can dive into a bit more detail in terms of our operations. Afius Pharma is developing cannabis-based FDA, FDA approved drugs for chronic pain, cancer pain, opioid use disorder, anxiety, and multiple sclerosis. We are dedicated both to the discovery, delivery, development, and commercialization of both cannabis and hemp-based drugs for the central and peripheral nervous system disorders with our initial targets of cancer pain, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathic pain, opioid use disorder, OUD, anxiety, and multiple sclerosis. The problem that we are solving or addressing is our internal systems where we have natural endocannabinoids. You, me, and every else one in the world, as we have evolved, we've developed this endocannabinoid or internal cannabinoid systems that helps balance our central and peripheral nervous systems. So sometimes when we have a physical intrusion from pain, either mental or physical, uh, these natural endocannabinoid systems can become unbalanced. An external cannabinoid that comes from cannabis, the plant can help. And we as human beings have been investigating this plant for thousands of years. Cannabis, however, consists about over 100 bioactive compounds 
including Delta-9, THC, and CBD. And hemp primarily contains CBD, but also contains THC. And because of the number of compounds that are involved, we create complicated interactions with both the peripheral and central nervous systems that can help rebalance our endocannabinoid system. Billions of us suffer from pain and anxiety, and these were evolutionarily developed to protect us from physical and mental harm. Um, in the United States, for example, over a third of the population or 110 million people suffer from chronic pain. 50% um, of cancer patients experience untreated pain. There's no therapeutics in the armor terms of drugs that can solve their problems currently. Um, and there's also pain from diseases such as multiple sclerosis as we age and from injuries. Now we all know about opioids and they can help. They are very effective at times, but they create a significant or massive problem. So common, common treatments for opioid use disorder, are, some of them are ineffective and they can also create addiction problems. Cannabis can be an effective treatment. However, there are limitations to how cannabis can be effective. Um, when cannabis, we typically inhale cannabis or digest cannabis orally. When we in inhale them, they are rapidly absorbed in our lungs. Um, the composition is not consistent, so therefore it's difficult to dose. And the impact is very short lived or acute. And this is not adequate for chronic use. That means, let's suppose you're a person who's suffering from anxiety. You can take a hit um, and that will help with your anxiety, but 20 minutes later, half an hour, 45 minutes later, you may need another hit. And that becomes problematic um, or pain, for example. Similarly, when cannabis are taken orally, they are rat rapidly degraded and excreted from our bodies. I usually say very much like olive oil. Cannab cannabinoids are very hydrophobic or oil-like. You drink them and they go right through your body. And therefore they're difficult to administer orally. So typically the bioavailability is only about 6%, it's 9% loss from the body. So while they can help, we need to keep them in the body longer and protect them from degradation. And what we're doing at Afia's Pharma is to nano-encapsulate these cannabinoids in nanoparticles. Currently cancer and opioid addiction are only treated with synthetic opioids. Um, that have significant adverse side effects. Cannabinoids are natural with less side effects. So our solution, sustain, release nanoparticles to keep them in the body longer. They also improve the stability from oxygen degradation and protect them from enzymes in the digestive tract and stomach acids. It protects them from first pass metabolism by liver enzymes and keep nanoparticles in circulation longer. And we do that by adding pegylation to the nanoparticles. In these polymer nanoparticles, which are biodegradable, as they degrade, they will release some of the cannabinoids. So the sustained release over an extended period of time, which increases the bioavailability from about 6% to about 30%. And it reduces dosing and improve its compliance and efficacy. So what we're doing basically is to transition an acute impact drugs into sustained release drugs for chronic indications. The market opportunity is huge and it consists of pain, opioid use disorder, anxiety, and multiple sclerosis. In the pain market, the Accessible marketplace is about $4.5 billion, growing at the rate of 5.6%. Opioid use disorder is about $2.5 billion, growing at the rate of 8.7%. Generalized anxiety disorder, which is a subset of anxiety, is about $2 billion in, by 2028, growing at about 2.5%. And multiple scrolls, which is a huge market, and we're really addressing that market for mainly for spasticity and pain. 
So our subcomponent of that marketplace is a $1 billion market growing at about 6.3% at an annual compounded growth rate. Now, you may ask, what is our competition? Um, and our competition is three, four, we have three tiers of competition. What I call a primary competition with companies such as Jazz Pharma, based in, uh, which just recently acquired GW Pharma from England for about $7.6 billion. So we differ from GW Pharma by utilizing proprietary and patented nanotechnology platforms to improve the delivery and efficacy of cannabinoids through oral and topical administration. Our secondary competition includes companies such as AbbVie and Par Pharmaceuticals who have drugs in the marketplace which are synthetic cannabis-based drugs like dronabinol. Well, the third level of competition, and this level of competition, we may have um, companies which may be candidates for collaboration um, with our technologies and products. They include pharmaceutical companies that have non-cannabis-based drugs against similar diseases, such as Biogen, Sanofi, Pfizer, and Merck. So again, you may ask, what is our attraction? What have we done with Affius Pharma LLC? And I'd like to discuss briefly here what have we have done on the research level and collaborative level. We worked closely with the National Institutes of Health, um, NIH, and the National Cancer Institute, initially to develop a Delta-9 THC cannabinoid product. And we've also worked with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, to develop a non-encapsulated Delta-9 THC for marijuana addiction. More recently, we've also worked with NIDA on the development of a CGMP manufacturing process for CBD from cannabis sativa or marijuana. That's an institutional level. On the industrial side, we've collaborated with Rhodes Pharma who manufactures synthetic um, Delta-9 THC to not encapsulate Delta-9 THC in biodegradable polymer nanospheres and phosphated liposomes for applications in the pharmaceutical industry. We've also collaborated with Alza Alexa Pharmaceuticals to manufacture Delta-9 THCA, which is a carboxylic acid of Delta-9 THC, and with Procellus Pharma to manufacture transdermal patches of Delta-9 THC and CBD. More on attraction in terms of manufacturing and agreements that we have in place, we have developed proprietary technologies for both manufacturing and nano-encapsulation of pharmaceutical grade pharmaceuticals, cannabinoids. We've established supercritical fluid manufacturing facility of 1,000 kilograms of pharmaceutical grade cannabinoids per year under CGMP and fully equipped Schedule 1 biohazard level safety two laboratories. We have an, an inventory of about 1.8 kilograms of cannabinoids, including CBD, CBDA, Delta-9 THC, Delta-9 THC, CBG, CBC, and CBN. And this is all covered by 16 patents on drug discovery, manufacturing, and nanotechnology drug delivery. And we have four pending patents that we are prosecuting internationally currently. We've established multi, multi, mutual non-disclosure agreements, MNDAs with GW Pharma. That was before they were purchased by um, Jazz Pharmaceuticals. And they were primarily interested in our nanotechnology drug delivery technologies. Erie Management Group, Fujimoto Pharmaceuticals out of Japan and Royal Emerald Pharmaceuticals out of California. And they are a manufacturer of Schedule One cannabis, which would be a source of our raw materials for developing our products. On intellectual properties, um, the slide deck will be available to um, observers um, and it's on the WeFunder site, but we have patents in the area of drug discovery drug manufacturing and drug crystallization, drug delivery, both for biodegradable polymer nanospheres, which are typically used for oral delivery 
or depot delivery or intranasal delivery and possible the nanosomes which utilize for topical or intravenous delivery of drugs and we have provisional applications in drug discovery manufacturing delivery um, use and route of administration pending our team myself um, I was introduced, I have about 30 years of experience in business in the biotechnology area. Dr. Judith Palmer Castor, who's our Director of Clinical and Regulatory Affairs. Judith has over 20 years of regulatory and clinical experience. Dr. Val Levada, who's a business advisor, I'm not gonna mention how many years of experience he has, but a lot. He's a retired senior lecturer of Sloan School of Management, MIT Cambridge, and an entrepreneur himself. And Ms. Catherine Pillow, who's a controller with over 30 years of accounting, financial analysis, and strategic planning experience. Our scientific advisors includes Dr. Arthur Lander. He's an MD, PhD neuroscientist, a professor of development in cell biology and biomedical engineer at the University of California at Irvine. Dr. Glenn T. Hong is a chemical engineer, founder of Concurrent Systems, an MIT grad and supercritical fluid expert. Dr. Gordon Craig is a natural product chemist. Um, he's ex-chief of the natural products branch of the National Cancer Institute. And Dr. Jonathan Stephen Alexander, he's a biologist and professor of molecular and cellular biology at Louisiana State University. Now we have several key opinion leaders that we work in that are uh, uh, subject matter experts in the areas that we are investigating. Dr. Stacy Gruber is an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital in Belmont, Mass. Stacy is an anxiety or anti-anxiety expert, and she works in the area of cannabis for both anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, which is one of the components of anxiety. And she is very clearly interested in facilitating our research and how we establish cannabinoid making medicines and with the launch of our program she believes that we are uniquely poised to make significant contributions to science and medicine my next key opinion leader is more into pain dr todd van der Rauh. he's professor and head of pharmacology at university of arizona and he works in the cannabis area and in the cancer area and he believes there's a great need for novel medications in cancer-induced peripheral neuropathic pain in order to reduce the underutilization of these effective chemotherapies. Often cancer patients, in, if they have neuropathy or pain, they try to avoid their cancer therapeutics and this results in the incomplete destruction of the cancer. So he's excited and intrigued about what we are doing. Our third key opinion leader, Dr. Brent Boyer, who is the Chief Medical Officer and Founder of Drug and Alcohol Treatment Centers, Pathway Healthcare. And he's our opioid use and, and substance use disorder key expert. And he was appointed by the Alabama governor to serve the governor's task force opioid addiction and abuse. And he'll be able to provide our team with advice and both progress and our molecule to and in the clinic. And our last key opinion leader is Dr. Jerry King, he's a retired university professor and supercritical fluid expert and author. And he has significant experience um, in the area of supercritical fluid and application to natural products. Um, he's aware of our technologies and our approaches to both isolate bioactive natural and marine products and to do nanoparticle synthesis. And he knows of our track record and therefore can attest to what we have done in the past with other natural products. Now, in terms of our plans, is a threefold plan. Our development strategy is to first isolate and manufacture specific cannabinoids using environmentally friendly supercritical carbon dioxide extraction and chromatographic purification technologies. Now, encapsulate these specific cannabinoids in bilateral polymer nanospheres utilizing our, again, patented supercritical fluid technologies to significantly improve oral bioavailability and sustained release. 
And then based on manufacturing the product, not encapsulating the product, conduct rigorous phase two clinical trials to demonstrate safety and efficacy. Um, there's a little bit more detail in this GAN chart in terms of our plans over the next four years. But in the first year to manufacture the pharmaceutical grade CBD, to scale up our PNS technology, the manufacturing technology is already scaled up, to non encapsulate the purified CBD, and to conduct in vitro and in vivo studies in year one and year two. Then we plan to file an investigational new drug um, application with the FDA to, um, on an unencapsulated cannabinoid. So before that, we have to conduct IND enabling studies. We plan to follow what is called a 505B2 pathway of the FDA to avoid phase one and to accelerate the clinical trial process. And this allows us the drugs which have already been approved by the FDA to go right into phase two proof of concept efficacy studies. And then if we have to, um, we'll do the phase three pivotal clinical trials on safety and efficacy and obtain FDA approval for the new drug application. So in terms of our plan, in terms of our funding history, ask and exit, IFIS Corporation, which is the mother organization, has spent about $46 million to date in developing the enabling technology platforms and knowledge used in the manufacturing and non-encapsulation of cannabinoids, of which $7.9 million was peer-reviewed grants from the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health of the NIH. Right now, we are crowdfunding to raise a million dollars to continue development studies and fundraise to raise up to $30 million for CGMP manufacturing to conduct the IND enabling studies and file an IND with the FDA and conduct phase two clinical trials. The exist strategy is three years or M&A in 2025. Um, alternatively, we plan to raise, do an IPO to raise $100 million in 2026 to complete clinical trials and file an NDA with the FDA. So we have three strategies, options for exiting. One is to do a partnership with a multinational such as Jazz, Pharma, Merck, Biogen, Abbeofis, and these are potential acquirers of Abbeofis Pharma. Um, alternatively, we'll seek to out-license nanocannabinoids as early as possible in the development cycle on a regional basis, not an international basis. The third option is to raise $100 million in an IPO to continue clinical development and commercial, commercialization of cannabinoids for CIPNP, anxiety, opioid use disorder, and on multiple sclerosis. Investors in A round, which is, this is going to be a part of the A round, can exit through the execution of merging acquisition in option one or an IPO in option three. And these are sort of a more granularity on the um, exit strategy with multiple opportunities. On this timeline here, in 2018, Afios Farm was founded. It did an exclusive license of 16 patents, four pending, access to equipment and CGMV facilities, and DEA one, Schedule 1 facilities. In 2021 to 2023, clinical and business development towards conducting phase two clinical trials and to establish commercial partners. In 2020, Four, we will see the first exit opportunity when we have a safety readout of phase two of the exit opportunity. And this will be based on a milestone based worldwide type license with typical historical upfront payments of $45 million. Then we'll do a pre commercialization exit opportunity in 2025 with a large partner such as Sanofi, Jazz, or Fujimoto, where we're looking about $200 million upfront about a billion dollars in bio dollars. Alternatively, we do an IPO in 2026 to raise $100 million to conduct phase three clinical trials 
and sell about 10 to 20 percent of the company to the public. That means the valuation of the company at this stage will be about one billion dollars. And we plan to do alternatively a phase three exit where we have a purchase opportunity with Jazz Farmer, for example, similar to GW Farmer. So thank you for your patience. I'd like to end with this slide, which sort of describes that we have a massive problem that we're dealing with in terms of pain and anxiety and opioid use disorder, but it's a massive opportunity also to balance our endocannabinoid systems. We have a vastly experienced team of key opinion leaders. We have patented manufacturing and drug delivery nanotechnologies and benefited from decades of development. And there are multiple exit opportunities to this investment opportunity. I thank you so much for your, press, um, for your attention. And I'd like to turn this over to our moderator at this time. Thank you, Dr. Trevor. Thank you for that presentation. Let us open this to our audience members. And if you want to welcome your colleagues and your team members, let's also welcome them on screen. Right. Um, should I um, basically stop share at this stage? Yes, you can stop sharing. Okay. And yes. Cool. So now the floor is open for our audience members to send in their questions. They can either put them in the chat box or use the Q&A feature to send in their questions. All I, right. I sort of want to introduce my um, audience, my panel panelist in Go the presentation. Ahead, yes. But that is Dr. Val Levada, who I said had tons of experience, entrepreneurial experience um, with small and large pharma and taught entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School um, in Cambridge, and is also an entrepreneur himself. Um, and then, of course, I introduced Dr. Judith L. Palmer, who's a director of regulatory and chemical affairs. And she has about 20 years of clinical and regulatory experience, both in academia, at Harvard Medical, um, Children's Hospital, as well as industry, um, Affius Corporation and Affius Pharma. And we can't see Kathy as yet because she may be having, but I think she is in communication with us so she can hear us, but maybe we can't see her. But Kathy has about 30 years of um, financial, regulatory and um, planning, uh, strategic planning experience um, in uh, industry um, with one very large multi-billion dollar company, which she did a number of, you know, um, buyouts and public offerings and whatnot with. Thank so you. I see we have um, some questions. Yes, let's take those. Okay, um, are there any plans to open a storefront pharmacy with Avios products? You know, we currently, um, we've thought about that, um, but you know, our plans are to get clinical trials done before we can open a, a storefront product. And then we'll go to an NDA type situation and then do an OTC storefront. There might be a potential opportunity to create a storefront product with non-encapsulated CBD because as an OTC or as a dietary supplement because it's not regulated in this month. We, we evaluate in that right now. We cannot do it with um, THC because that's still under Schedule 1, but we may be able to do it with CBD. All right. Thank you for that response. Okay. Do you have any competitors? Yes, we have lots of competitors um, in this space. Um, they are evaluating this space very carefully because our competitors are mainly pharmaceutical companies. Uh, our major pharmaceutical competitors, Jazz Pharmaceutical, which recently purchased GW Pharma for $7.6 billion. Um, and then there's a lot of evolving um, companies that are in this space. Now, we, we have indirect competitors like in medicinal cannabis field, um, but that's um, a different type of competitor that we see um, and a different type of strategy in terms of the way we approach that. 
Right. Thank you. So I hope that answers Elena's question. Um, there's one more from her. And I know that you spoke about this a fair bit during your presentation when you were speaking about um, the details for exit and a couple of other slides. So do you want to speak a little more about your goals for expansion and your you know, goal for Affios Pharma that you have? Well, the goal basically for Affios Pharma is to establish clinical trials. That's so really short. And we have to get into the clinic. We have to demonstrate efficacy. Um, cannabinoids are not anecdotally to work and they work acutely. We have to demonstrate efficacy so we can determine how much of a dose we give that patient. In what sequence do we give that patient? How does it work? So that it can be prescribed, uh, someone has pain, cancer um, induced peripheral neuropathic pain so that the patient can go to a doc and say, is this drug going to interact with my other medicines? We have, we have to determine that. You know, how often do I have to take it? And for how long can I take it? And these are the questions that we, we will provide in terms of doing rigorous clinical trials. Right, thank you, Dr. Trevor. What platform will the next campaign raise capital for investors? What I believe the, what they want to ask is that what platform would you be using to raise invest you know capital from investors? Okay, so to to go from the one million dollar raise to the um, thirty million dollar raise, we'll have to do what is called a, a Reg D type um, or Reg A plus type investment. So we probably do that on a platform called Fundables, initially Fundables, which they do um, high net worth in investors. Um, um, and then we'll go to, in, to investment bankers to raise money for institutional investors. Now, we are also going to evaluate the option of doing an early stage um, IPO. So, our goal is to get to $30 million so we can get to doing the clinical trials. And the question is, how do we get that funded? So we are, for example, evaluating um, CFOs currently to bring on board who have IPO experience, who can get, get us through an early IPO process. This will be a significant departure of the typical strategy of companies who work in this business. So we're working right now on what is called a Jobs Act. That was, part, that was signed up by President Obama in 2018, which allows individuals who are not high net worth, ordinary individuals, to invest. So, but if they invest now and they do an IPO, they can get the benefits of the step up in the IPO that typically was sort of organized for people who are very wealthy people. They benefited from that. The, the guy who's working a nine to five job could not benefit from that opportunity. What we try to do is make that opportunity benefit from him. So this opportunity is a safe opportunity and safe means same as future equity. So all the investors right now who invest $250, they will not be squashed down by future investors until we get a $30 million. But they're going to have a step up once we get over that. Um, rain. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Trevor, for that response. Are there any examples of FDA-approved drugs from cannabis? Yes, the first um, drug that got approved for cannabis was by GW Pharma um, called Epidiolex, and it's a purified CBD um, formulation in a lipid formulation is like an oil-based formulation. It's actually, I believe it's in sesame seed oil. And that's for children, a select group of children who have epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. And it works wonderfully. But again, it's an acute mm. application because it is in an olive oil, which can be pulled right through the body very quickly. And by the way, that's the, that, that drove the reason for the acquisition of GW Pharma by Jazz Pharmaceuticals for $7.6 billion, that particular drug. Now, there was an earlier drug called Marinol, um, which is utilized for, and that's a synthetic Delta 9 THC um, for 
patients, uh, cancer patients who have nausea and vomiting, CNIV, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. That drug has been in the market for a number of years, and that drug is also in sesame seed oil, and it also has the same problems with bioavailability and enzymatic um, destruction in the kidneys and liver. But those are the two major ones, one synthetic and one natural. Thank you. On similar lines, we have a question. Do you have any other previous clinical trial data involving supercritical fluid pr produced vehicle, either the nanoparticles or lipid-based vesicles? No, we do not have previous clinical data. Okay. For cannabinoids utilizing, that's what we are, that's our strategy right now is to establish that clinical data. Thank you. Can you provide an example or examples of companies that trailblazed a similar path as yours developing FDA-approved cannabis-based drugs? So I know you gave examples, just one right now. Yeah, that the same example is um, Afios Pharma, but, um, but examples are people GW Pharma, and they okay. and they they started their company in two thousand and two, I believe. And the journey was a long and challenging journey to get to the point where they had drug approval for their product. But what they have done is they have set a pathway that will help us ease our pathway towards FDA approval. Right. They will reduce our, our burn rate, our the capital expenditure, our regulatory strategies, and a lot of it has been established by them doing that work. So what they have done in 20 years, we hope to do in three to four years. Three to four years, excellent. Um, so I know there have been many studies regarding this, but do you want to tell our audience members why is cannabis good for pain? Yeah, there is um, a lot of studies on it and there are a lot of rational why it's good for pain. We know anecdotally it works. Yes. But pain is um, typically um, is triggered and recognized in the brain, in the central nervous system brain, with certain receptors. So cannabis can help satisfy those receptors and prevent the sensing of pain. So just like um, the, the certain receptors in the brain that when, you, when, you, when, you, when we feel pain, physical pain, and that's why, for example, uh, amputees may have a sense in their brain that they still have can feel pain in a leg which is amputated because the, it's triggered sense. So the cannabinoids, and they, they, there's what is called CBD1, CB1 and CB2 receptors, cannabinoid receptors. And once they're satisfied, they can reduce or ameliorate the pain felt by those receptors. Okay. Thank you. So now our audience knows why cannabis is good for pain. And yeah. once, yeah, go ahead, yes. So there are a lot of other ion channels and a lot of complex microbiology and molecular biology reasons. But I think at the end of the day, it's how it interacts with our central nervous systems. With our central nervous system, exactly, yes. Thank you. Um, for our audience members, we have a couple of minutes. So if anybody wants to send in their questions, now would be the time. So doctor, what do you plan to do with the money raised? That's a good question. For the first million raised, we plan to do about, I think about 42, percent in terms of research and development towards an IND, about 20% in terms of manufacturing, about another 20% what is called general administrative cost, basically management cost, and about 10% in marketing. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Trevor and Judith, Dr. Val, Ms. Kathy, um, before we end, is there anything that you all would like to share with our audience members? Well, I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna jump in and say it, it's, a, it's a really good investment opportunity. We've been dealing with pain and anxiety for thousands of years, evolutionary. We've also been dealing 
thousands of years trying to figure out how cannabis works and how it helps our systems. And there's a balance between external cannabinoids and internal can our internal endocannabinoid system and how best to match that up. We believe we have part of the magic to do that because you cannot have the balance in if you have the material that it goes into your body and goes out very quickly either through smoking or just you have to keep it in the body longer. And by keeping specific cannabinoids in the body longer, we believe that we can help sustain the release of cannabinoids and to help people with chronic pain, chronic anxiety, chronic multiple sclerosis, and chronic opioid use disorder. Thank you, Dr. Trevor, for sharing, you know, all these amazing things with us today. Okay, just before we, okay, we have one more question. Do you have animal studies or clinical trial data using your vehicles for the nanoparticle or lipid-based vesicles demonstrating extended release? Yes, we do. And we have it for um, a number of different models, um, including Alzheimer's disease models, where it's important in terms of extended release. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Trevor. Thank you, team, for being here, sharing the presentation and the thought behind Afios Pharma with our audience members today. All the very best for your goal. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day ahead. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.